Hello, my name is Matthew, and today we'll be talking about hallucinogenic beer and a proposed method to make it. This is a interesting little presentation uh, in the plant stuff category. It's an example of synthetic biology. So that's what we'll be talking about today. It's a proposed method for making hallucinogenic beer. Okay. Uh, it is Claimer. Uh, this is an academic exercise and it's educational as well. It's, it's uh, not an endorsement or promotion of consumption of intoxicants. So this is, uh, this is just an educational thing. This is not, not real. I just have to say that legally, I think. Uh, so, um, you know, this is a, a uh, carboy, which is used to brew beer. So in here we have a, a nice sugary solution. Uh, that is uh, fermenting. And so there's yeast in here and they're bubbling and creating carbon dioxide. And on top, we have a thing called an airlock. This airlock allows air to escape, but not to enter. So it keeps it uh, sterile and clean inside, you know, no contamination. So, you know, this is a beer brewing in a closet in a uh, closet in Berkeley with my, my roommate, Matthew Liu, who took the photo. Uh, so, uh, you know, we can make beer, but can we make hallucinogenic beer? That's the real, you know, $10 question. Uh, now let's make a hypothesis. Uh, can we make hallucinogenic beer by engineering brewer's yeast to produce a hallucinogenic compound? So an overview of what we're going to talk about today, a background to synthetic biology, designing hallucinogenic yeast, and we're going to reflect back on our hypothesis. So step one, the background. What is synthetic biology? Synthetic biology is the scientific discipline that combines science and engineering in order to design and build novel biological systems and functions. And so what can we make with synthetic biology? Well, uh, we can make organic compounds, uh, which can then be used to make plastic or fuel, perfume, and even medicine. So these are all hugely important economically. Um, so you can see why synthetic biology might have a, a significant role in uh, developing uh, products of the future. So this is a plant called wormwood. It's in the genus Artemisia, it's a species annua. So Artemisia annua is a scientific name of this plant. And it produces this wonderful compound called artemisinin or artemisinin, depending how you wanna say it. And this compound was found to be an anti-malarial um, drug. So this plant makes this chemical compound that can fight malaria and prevent malaria. Now we'd have to grow a ton of this plant to be able to get a lot of this to treat malaria. Perhaps we can synthesize or create this inside of a, a small organism by integrating the enzymes necessary to produce artemisinin. Uh, and then be able to produce it more efficiently. And that's what some folks in Berkeley have done. Um, pretty big deal. And so let's take a look at what synthetic biology is. Synthetic biology has three main components. We're gonna go through them right now. So the first one is we mine for genes. So we take a, a plant or some organism and, and we look through uh, the genome and we sequence it to determine the pathways and kind of what stuff it can produce and how it makes it. And so the, the little machines inside that are used to make different chemical compounds are called enzymes. So then we can build a database with all these enzymes and, uh, and then build an artificial pathway. So we build a synthetic or artificial pathway and then we can integrate it into a, a, a simple organism, uh, a single cell organism rather like yeast or E. coli, these are two popular ones. So yeast is a little fungus, E. coli is a little bacteria. We can take our genetic information that encodes for these enzymes and put them into our um, single-celled organism. And so it has the machines in there and it's ready to do their thing, has the enzymes. So we give it a feedstock, maybe it's a sugar. So the feedstock goes in and it you know carries out normal metabolic processes, but then some of that feedstock goes in towards the pathway that we inserted in. We're engineering this organism. 
So it's called metabolic engineering. And then we produce our product and we can design it so that um, the bacteria or yeast can then push out the product and we can collect it. The last step is industrial production. This would be scaling up the production of those compounds in large bioreactors. So growing, basically like, you know, making giant things of beer, brewing, brewing, uh, brewing beer if you're doing yeast or something. Um, but yeah, so that's synthetic biology for you. you. Look at this beautiful summation. And so today uh, we'll be looking at this section here. Looking at this section here. Is it even recording? Oh yeah, it's recording, okay. Uh, we'll be looking at this section here uh, in the beer production. So let's design hallucinogenic yeast. You know, this is an example, it's not real. So let's, let's make some questions. You know, we have questions like, what hallucinogenic compounds should we produce? Uh, what is our starting substrate? So what, what is uh, what we're gonna start with? What enzymes do we need? And where are the compounds produced? Will the compound degrade in the beer? And how much of the compound will be present in the beer? So these are some major questions we have to address. You know, maybe if we have uh, you know, too much of the hallucinogenic compound, it could be deleterious to the human consumption. So let's address the first question. What hallucinogenic compound should we produce? Well, LSD sounds like a wonderful one, right? Uh, LSD, everyone thinks about LSD when they think about hallucinations. The issue is that it's a little complex. Let's go for something um, simpler in terms of chemical structure. Mescaline. Now, mescaline is this kind of a uh, simple compound with these uh, four functional groups on this little ring, benzene ring thing here. So it's called 3,4-trimethyloxypentholethylalamine. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and it's it's in two different families of plants, the cactus family, cactaceae, and the bean family, fabaceae. Uh, so it's a naturally occurring compound. It's uh, biosynthesis pathways already known. So that makes it easy for us. We don't have to discover anything. And it's a psychedelic compound with minimal severe adverse effects. If you combine that with alcohol, you know, I don't know, it's a two for one kind of thing. Anyway. So uh, there are some different cacti that produce our mescaline. We have uh, this, this plant in uh, my backyard or my family's backyard in California. It's called the San Pedro cactus. It's called the San Pedro cactus because, um, well, this was um, a South, uh, South American cactus. And so the uh, Spaniards brought it into the indigenous populations and they tried you know, to convert people to Catholicism. And they said, you know, if you consume this plant, it's like going to heaven. You see St. Peter at the gates because of the mescaline makes you hallucinate. And then this is peyote, the uh, little small cactus that's most notably identified with mescaline. But both of these, you can, I think you can legally grow. Well, I know for sure you can legally grow San Pedro cactus because we grow it. As long as you don't consume it, it's fine. Uh, and this is our dog, Cody identifying the mescaline cactus. So let's, uh, let's take a look at this pathway. So this is the pathway to get to mescaline. We can start here, we can start here, we can start here. So these are the chemical compounds and the arrows indicate a reaction facilitated by this enzyme. So there's a name of an enzyme here and that enzyme is what basically gets you from that step to that step. And we can follow the arrows uh, through. And you'll see that this one's unidentified. Some of these have very specific names and, and so forth. Um, and that's, uh, that's what we'll do. So we need to uh, identify a substrate. So let's, 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 uh, let's put some tags onto these. So I'm just going to call these 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 to make it easier. So when we're talking about it, we can keep it simple. And then we have enzymatic steps. So we're gonna call them A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. So I've identified one. So all the numbers are substrates and all the enzymatic steps are letters. So second question, uh, what should our starting substrate be? Well, you know, when we look at starting substrate, we have a feedstock and then we have some precursors. So which precursor should we select? That's really 
what we're, we're what we're interested in right now. So we know we're working with yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. It's a very cool. It's also called brewer's yeast because you make beer with it. Some people do, not everyone. Good people do. Um, and so in brewer's yeast, uh, we actually have this um, compound. This substrate here is an amino acid, and we can start there. So. Uh, you know, we could start at either of these really because it would be so ideally we want the least number of steps. So the least number of stuff we have to add into the into the yeast. So it's somewhat arbitrary which one we select, you can identify which one is produced more. But let's let's do this, this step here. Let's start here. So uh, we can then look at so if we look at this, we need to find uh, a tyrosine hydroxylase. So this is where we're starting. We need to find the enzyme that can catalyze this reaction to get us to four. So from two to four. So this is L-DOPA. And so what we can do is we can go into a database and uh, and look. So this, I'm looking through, uh, this is the code for the yeast. I'm looking for that enzyme to see if it's present already. So if it's already present, maybe we just upregulate it. If it's not present, then we're going to have to add it. And so it says no results. This is KEG, uh, Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomics, I think. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, we're, this is our starting substrate. We're going to insert this tyrosine hydroxylase, which I'm calling C, so that we can get L-DOPA as our next substrate. And then we just keep doing this for all of them. So what enzymes do we need? Well, uh, you know, what the real question is what enzymes are needed for uh, in yeast for the mescaline biosynthetic pathway, which is what we've already identified. And so here I'm just naming them all out with the names that we call like the trivial name or kind of like the colloquial name of them. So we have tyrosine hydroxylase, the dopa decarboxylase, and then so forth. Uh, G though is unidentified, so we'll get to that. Um, so it turns out that uh, two of these are the same. So F and H are actually the same enzyme. So that makes it easier. So we only have we only have to insert five enzymes into this to get our mescaline, presumably. You know. Uh, so what we can do is we can go to Swiss Prot, which is a database, um, and they have uh, enzymes, and they have a specific thing called an enzyme nomenclature uh, that we're going to look at here. So oh, my face is always in the way. Enzyme nomenclature or enzyme commission number, which is called the EC. Is a system that was created in 1992. And what it does is it categorizes and creates categories for enzymes based on the type of reaction. So presently, and as of you know 2018, there's seven categories. So these are just the types of biochemical reactions that enzymes can 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 undertake. And so this is a extract excerpt from Wikipedia. And so what we call them is that, you know, enzyme commission number. So EC1 through seven. So each of them has a general name. So this one, you know, is oxidoreductase and transferase and so forth. Um, there's a typical reaction that it will do. And there's also a uh, example enzymes. So the oxidoreductases generally are oxidases or dehydrogenases um, and so forth. And so these are the seven different names or groups that we have for enzymes. So when we're looking through databases, we want to know what the EC number is, because that's going to give us a specific enzyme uh, reaction. Oh, what is this? Keg, that's it. Keg, I love Keg, the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes. There we are. So what Keg does is it, it takes lots of information and uh, links it together. So KEG receives genome and metagenomic information, metabolomic information. So, you know, information about, uh, you know, vitamins that might be produced and uh, pathogens and stuff. And it puts it together in a systems approach. So it builds systems information, chemical information, health and genomic information. And uh, you can interpret this to understand uh, scientific systems. And so this is what the website looks like. They have pathways and, and the genes and genomes and compounds and enzymes and diseases and everything. Uh, my favorite is pathways because you can see how everything fits together. 
And so this is a table of contents where you can see the systems information is here, genomic information is here, chemical information, your reactions, and then health information. So let's get back to uh, making hallucinogenic beer. So we need to find a tyrosine hydroxylase enzyme to catalyze our reaction so we can get to L-DOPA. So if we type in, you know, search for enzyme, search enzyme for tyrosine hydroxylase, it gives us a couple options. And so this number here, that's the EC number. So this would be EC category one, EC category one, EC category two. And then there's additional um, demarcations you know, in this uh, hierarchy um, nomenclature system. And so, you know, there's a one, there's a one, and there's a two. So this one's a two, that's a little different from the other ones. It's a, the, a kinase, and then these two are monooxygenases, but they're slightly different apparently based on this number. So what we wanna do is, you know, we can click on them. So we clicked on what's, clicked on the middle one. So click, and it takes us to this page. And it gives us information. So the EC number, EC 1.14.16.2, it's an enzyme. That's great. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for enzymes here. Uh, there's names for it. It's an oxidoreductase. That's consistent with our understanding from, uh, from that Wikipedia thing, that table. And so there we go. Uh, the substrate is L-tyrosine. That's what we're looking for. So we're looking for an enzyme that gets us from L-tyrosine to L-dopa. And says the product is L-dopa. This is fantastic. It also says this other one here. So that might be concerning. But, you know, uh, we can read the comments and see what it says. Um, additionally, we can look at the pathways and see where it fits in. So it's in the tyrosine metabolism and um, secondary metabolite biosynthesis. So this is a map of all the secondary metabolites that occur in plants. And each of these little dots is a chemical, a compound, and then each of these lines represents a reaction. So there'd be an enzyme that, presumably an enzyme catalyzing the reaction to get to another point. And so all these are connected in different ways. Um, the particular interesting uh, component we're looking at is in this little pathway here with our tyrosine here. We can see everything kind of links together to some extent. Um, and that's just kind of a, a good systems approach. And so let's go back to our page. You know, we have all this information. Uh, and then there's some genes. So HSA, that's a human. And this other one, I don't know what that is, probably some primate, I, I don't know, a human. So there's, it'll give us information of the genes. So here we have, we scroll down the page. Those are all the genes and we can look at all of them um, and find the gene in different organisms. And then we keep going down the page and we'll see a link to other databases so, you know, keg is great because what it does, you know, this is actually, this whole video is an advertisement for keg, if you didn't know. Um, keg is a uh, database that incorporates pathways, modules, genomes, genes, expression information, enzymes, and then it links it to other ones. So each of these little gray lines represents how keg relates to other databases. So SwissProt is the Swiss database. We have NCBI, which is an American database. UniProt, I think it's also a Swiss database. RefSeq is an American database. And so, um, you know, we can see that KEG is in the middle here with this red kind of line. And, and then uh, it, it pulls information. PubMed is American database for journals. And so all this information is linked um, in this particular diagram, they put keg in the middle because they're promoting themselves, of course, but they should, they're fantastic. Um, but that's besides the point. So let, um, this links. So if we want to find links to, to get to our enzymes, uh, we can go to the genes. So we're looking for that enzyme C. And so we can find a gene, we need a sequence. So let's find a sequence that we can use. So if we're dealing with yeast, Yeast is a fungus. Maybe we'll want to find one in another fungus. So in keg, the first three letters represent a specific species or organism. So there's a code, there's a sheet you can look at to find the different uh, codes and see where they relate. Um, and you can find a fungus one. Uh, you know, maybe you don't want a fungus, maybe you want to be kind of fun. This one is a great blue spotted mud skipper. So perhaps we get the genetic sequence for our enzyme, 
the tyrosine monooxygenase uh, mono from this blue spotted mudskipper, this beautiful little fish. Uh, and so all the information for the amino acid sequence and um, genetic sequence are going to be below. So I just copied and pasted the genetic sequence, um, which is at that link there. It's 172 nucleotides from Mud Skipper. And, you know, another thing to note is that we just took this information from a Mud Skipper and that organism has a specific way that it metabolizes, or I'm sorry, transcribes information. And it has a specific preference for different codons. So a codon is a three base pair sequence that corresponds to an amino acid. So when you're building your protein, you're building it uh, as a, you know, with amino acids, different organisms are going to have different um, preferences or we'll say codon usage biases. Let's see, codon usage biases. So for example, Arishia e. coli, so E. coli, it has a 92% usage of this particular codon, CUG, over these other codons. So all of these will make leucine, but 92% of the time that it's trying to make leucine, it's going to use this one. So what we need to do is we need to um, make sure we optimize our sequence for the, the organism that we're inserting it into. So what, what this is, is you know codon usage bias relates to the respective tRNA pool. So if the tRNAs are, um, it, so in E. coli, there's gonna be tRNAs that are kind of ready to do this CUG. But if you insert a sequence that is a UUG, it's just not gonna be as efficient and you're not gonna get as much production. So, you know, look at that 92%. So this is pretty cool. Cool, what we need to do is cool codon optimization online. So what we can do is we can optimize our sequence for a specific organism. So we're taking it, we're taking that sequence we had back here uh, from Mudskipper and we're trying to put it into yeast. So we need, to, we need to optimize it. And so when we do that, we can go through this online website um, and, and, uh, and essentially tell it that we're gonna put it in yeast so we have a, you know, this other stuff you can let the default go, but you know, the most important one is selecting your expression. So the target expression host. So if you're gonna take a gene from something and you wanna put it into something else, you wanna select the one you're gonna put. So if we're putting it in Homo sapiens, we'll select this one, but we're gonna select Saccharomyces cerevisiae. That's our, our yeast. And it's gonna optimize it. And so then we get an output like this which, which tells us kind of uh, how, it's, how it's optimizing it. And then what kind of things had to be changed to, to make it better. So how cool is it? Well, it's pretty cool. So now we've, we have the sequence, but the codons are optimized for yeast. So this is from the mud skipper, but now it's ready to go in yeast and be efficient because of the tRNA pool that is uh, most frequently occurring. Okay, so we just did C, that's great. So we now, you know, we've got from this uh, L-tyrosine down to L-dopa. So we're, we're working our way downtown. All right, so now for the enzyme E, the, the dopa decarboxylase, which is a code 4.1.1.28, I just selected, you know, I did the same process and I selected the, the one from human. And then, you know, we can keep going through and I collect the genetic sequences. So this one's from bread mold for those enzyme for that enzyme. And then for this one, unidentified hydroxylase, we have this substrate, something, some kind of hydroxylase that is going to add uh, an OH group here. That's what it does. It's, so we got to find an enzyme that can add an OH onto this substrate. You know. So what what the hell is sorry, what is this substrate? This substrate is called 3-methoxytriamine. And so now we know what that's called. We can look it up and see what's available on Wikipedia. Turns out it's uh, you know one enzymatic step away from dopamine. And here we have it here. And then we can take this information and, and then start looking through enzymes. And so now we found this one enzyme here uh, and we have the EC number. And so once we have the EC number, oh, sorry, 
that's not the right EC number. Um, so we don't need this enzyme, but we, we look at this information here um, and then going through it, we found that we need a hydroxylase. And so there was a tyrosine hydroxylase, which makes a lot of sense because we're, we started with tyrosine and we're adding an OH. So that's a tyrosine hydroxylase. It's an EC1. So let's, this is my guess based on my, my, my searching. Um, and so I kind of inserted that or, you know, so we had a tyrosine hydroxylase up here at step C. Um, for my research, it looks like a tyrosine hydroxylase might also be able to work for step G. And so uh, what happened there? Oh, oh yeah. So step I will actually also be the same as F and H. Um, it'll still catalyze that. So G is unresolved at this point, but you know, my guess was that maybe it's going to be the similar or the same as C, the enzyme in C. So let's look at these last questions. Where is the compound produced? Will the compound degrade in the beer? And how much of the compound will be present in the beer? These are all important questions. So, you know, going back, we're going to be inserting our, our genetic information into our, our yeast, and it's going to have this particular pathway, but there could be a lot of things that happen. So somewhere in between, we could have, you know, one substrate be used up by a different metabolic process. One substrate doesn't make, you know, if one substrate gets out of whack, it's going to disrupt uh, what we might expect. So if we're expecting that there's going to be a lot of input into our, our synthetic pathway, that'll work, right? And so there's a lot of assumptions kind of into what I've said, and I've simplified it for the example, but you know, it's important to take into account that you're going to have a lot of loss. And so we need to evaluate the pathways. And, um, you know, our starting substrate we're saying is, is tyrosine down here. So our starting substrate is tyrosine. And, you know, what is feeding into it? Um, what is interacting with it? What is it tyrosine becoming? Tyrosine is metabolized. So we might have to upregulate certain enzymes that make tyrosine. So we might have to you know, go along this pathway and, and then insert um, some, some promoters to those so that it starts making more and more of those enzymes so we can make more tyrosine so that can feed into our synthetic bio, synthetic pathway. So now we need to integrate the genes. So if we integrate the genes, we can do homolog uh, homol homologous recombination, which is a pretty low efficiency of less than 1%, but there's a system called Lambda Red, which is pretty efficient. I'm not going to go into details, but you know, just to say, you know, how it's going to go in there. And so the hypothesis is, can we make hallucinogenic beer by engineering brewer's yeast to produce a hallucinogenic compound? Uh, probably. So, you know, it, it would probably work based on, you know, what I've described. To some extent, there'd be something in there that might be mescaline. And these are the references. So, uh, you know, I hope you, uh, you have learned a few things about synthetic biology and how you can use information from databases and from pathways and enzymes um, to build molecules and how we can use information from plants to better understand um, a medicine and things like that. So uh, all the best. You know, this, was, uh, this wasn't real. This was for educational purposes. Legally, I have to say that.